Indeed, uh, the issue I want to discuss is uh, the nature of space and time from the point of view of uh, quantum gravity theorists. And uh, I will focus on uh, uh, different levels in which one can say space time emerges from non spatial temporal entities in quantum gravity. I'll try to highlight both uh, conceptual aspects of the issue. And uh, I will uh, give uh, one uh, tentative and partial concrete realization of this uh, uh, emergence uh, in a particular quantum gravity formalism. So before uh, discussing how space time can emerge from quantum gravity, uh, I guess I have to say what, what I'm going to mean by space and time uh, in this uh, presentation. And okay, the intuition is the one we all share, uh, space and time as the location of physical events, uh, the distance between the same events, the notion of duration for change, uh, and so on. I mean, the intuition is the common one. More concretely, I'll take the physicist uh, attitude and say, okay, we have a theory for uh, uh, space and time, a mathematical description that seems to work very well, which is general relativity. So I mean by space time, whatever general relativity says uh, uh, space time is. And so I have to say something more about uh, what in my view space time says. Uh, about the nature of space and time. Uh, uh, and uh, this follows from uh, you know, the invariances of the theory, the homomorphism invariance, uh, the fact that uh, uh, there are only uh, dynamical fields in general relativity. So there's no background uh, space time structure in, in terms of a metric. There could be a topological uh, background structure if you fix the topology. Uh, the global topology of your manifold. But uh, the main the first lesson of general relativity from this point of view is that uh, uh, space and time are not absolute. There's no such thing as an absolute notion of temporal or spatial direction, or there's no absolute notion of location or distance. The manifold itself, uh, due to diffeomorphism invariance, plays a global role. Uh, some topological restriction on the allowed uh, geometries, but no local manifold structure like points or directions or paths or coordinate frames has uh, a direct physical significance. And what exists in general relativity and out of which we could, uh, we had to extract our notion of space and time are dynamical fields, continuum dynamical fields, among which uh, the metric field. In order to reconstruct the notion of space and time, I'm going to assume that the best strategy uh, in, the, in the general setting is, is the uh, relational one. So one has to uh, identify space and time from relations among dynamical fields. And these relations had to include the metric field in order to give them any space or uh, spatial or temporal characterization. And uh, this means uh, that you, we have to identify some appropriate internal degree of freedom of the system, for example, some matter field, and use it uh, as a, a physical definition of a clock that is of time or broad, say, if you want to define a space. And in terms of, of such physical clock and rods, uh, we can then parameterize uh, the evolution and location of the other degrees of freedom of the theory. And the, you know, the sketchy idea is that uh, uh, you, you may have the Ricci curvature uh, at a given uh, coordinate time. You also have the, a certain scalar field value at a given time. Uh, the given coordinate time is not physical. So what you do is to sort of invert the coordinate time for the scalar field, you insert it in the Ricci scalar, and then you have a new quantity, which is the Ricci scalar for a given value of the scalar field. And this is a different variant definition of what you may mean by the Ricci scalar at a given point in time, at a given instant of time. This reconstruction is already a sense in which space-time in generativity has to emerge 
from a, a structure in which there's no absolute uh, preferred notion of uh, space or time. So I call it level minus one of space-time emergence. So everything here is, of course, uh, classical and so on. Of course, points, uh, coordinates, trajectories on the manifold, uh, we use them all the time. But uh, I'm going to take the uh, point of view uh, according to which these are just uh, useful fictions that, uh, in fact, uh, are a way of representing uh, physical frames, uh, so clock and rods in this relational uh, strategy, in a particular approximation, which we basically can forget uh, that they have their own energy, their dynamics, that they are physical system coupled to one, coupled to one another. Um, of course, the, this problem of reconstructing space and time in general activity, we, we can also uh, circumvent it if we have special solutions of the theory or if we have boundaries, but that's a, a particular story. Already at this stage, there are some issues in the foundations of space and time that you all know very well. One can argue that this way of understanding space-time in general relativity is a sort of new form of substantivalism because uh, space and time uh, are associated to, with physical substances, uh, which are the fields, in particular the metric field. Uh, but you can also say, because of the relational strategy, this is a new form of relationalism because it's only out of relations among physical fields that you can reconstruct the notion of space and time. So maybe you can also see it as a reconciliation of both uh, uh, traditional perspectives. Anyway, I'm not going to enter this debate. This is the perspective on classical space time that I'm going to uh, keep as a reference for my um, uh, discussion on emergence of space and time from quantum gravity. So, and this is a, uh, the picture, so we have general relativity in a diffio invariant language. So if, if we were able to reformulate it fully in terms of these relational quantities uh, without ever introducing uh, any redundancy like uh, local manifold structures. And then there is the version of GR in which instead we rely on all this additional structure uh, with the care needed to uh, uh, make sure we speak about physical uh, quantities. So what changes uh, regarding space and time from this picture when we go to quantum gravity? Well, the first point I want to emphasize is that it depends a lot on what we intend quantum gravity to be. The most straightforward understanding of what quantum gravity is or should be is that is the quantization of general relativity or some other classical gravitational theory resulting from applying some uh, appropriate quantization procedure. Could be some canonical quantization, some uh, path integral, whatever. Um, the point is that there is a second point possibility about quantum gravity. And it stems from the fact that we have a lot of uh, results uh, in uh, classical and semi-classical gravitational physics that suggest that uh, the very notion of continuum fields, uh, the continuum space-time that we use in uh, general activity uh, will sort of break down or not be fundamental, but uh, has to be understood as a collective notion in itself. Of course, I'm not going to discuss uh, any of these uh, hints, but there are several. None of them is conclusive. But it's, at least together, they suggest that uh, a different perspective of quantum gravity is at the very least uh, uh, conceivable. And in fact, a number of quantum gravity approaches also, uh, when starting from a more uh, conservative point of view, end up uh, suggesting uh, new structures being more fundamental uh, and underlying the usual uh, continuum understanding of uh, space-time we did use from general relativity. So a, a second perspective on quantum gravity is that quantum gravity is some microscopic uh, theory of uh, non-spatial temporal quantum degrees of freedom out of which uh, uh, not only classical general relativity but, but every no any notion of quantum general relativity will have to emerge. So it's a different type of uh, uh, situation than just quantizing and then having to recover classical structure, maintaining the same degrees of freedom. 
So let's consider the first possibility uh, to start with. So if quantum gravity just quantum generativity or some other quantiza quantization of some other classical gravitational theory, well, the key point is that uh, we have the same fundamental entities, the same type of degrees of freedom, and we are just uh, to manage to describe it at the, at the quantum level. Now, this is in fact already a, a very radical, uh, will give us already a very radical departure from our usual notions of space and time. Just uh, imagine that uh, this implies that all space-time notions, geometry, causal structure, localization, duration, as defined in classical general relativity, will be subject to uncertainty, superposition, uh, in interference, entanglement, uh, discretization of spectra, and so on. At least this is what we should expect, simply bringing together what we know about uh, uh, quantum theory and what we know about uh, general relativity. So any space-time notion should be expected to lose uh, any sharp uh, uh, meaning or characterization. So it's clear that uh, already this level, uh, uh, we have to move uh, to uh, an understanding of space and time that would be radically different from uh, the already uh, radical uh, understanding given by general relativity. This is what I call level zero of space-time emergence. Uh, space-time as we know it uh, will, will have to emerge in a classical approximation to be defined and uh, after relational reconstruction from some quantum notion of space and time. And of course, there are already at this level, there are many issues. At the physical level, we have uh, the problem of a quantum classical transition, which is already subtle in uh, uh, more uh, mundane uh, physical system than uh, space-time itself. And it is uh, challenging even more when we discuss space-time as a physical system. The additional practical difficulty would be that we, we probably cannot uh, resort uh, to the auxiliary structures that we use in classical general relativity to circumvent the troubles with the uh, uh, different morphism invariants and so on. And then we have at the more conceptual issues, we have uh, on the one hand, the new ontological issues concerning uh, what we mean by quantum space-time, what are the fundamental entities uh, if space-time itself is subject to all the quantum uh, um, uh, aspects of physical systems of other physical systems. And I have to add that we will, we will have to reconsider carefully all issues in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Because again, we cannot rely in our interpretation of the quantum mechanical formalism that here I assume we are not changing just to avoid the additional troubles. We have to reconsider all our interpretations of, uh, of the quantum formalism itself. So, Already what I call level zero of space-time emergence, it's a lot of work for physicists and philosophers, of course. And this is the arrow there, is the arrow of emergence at level uh, zero. So from quantum general relativity to classical general relativity, maintaining the fundamental degrees of freedom. Well, The moment uh, you consider the second perspective on quantum gravity, you realize that in fact, there are more levels of space-time emergence which become possible. If quantum gravity is a quantum theory of a different type of entities, not just the continuum fields of general relativity, but non-spatial temporal entities, so you change uh, degrees of freedom, well, then uh, you have uh, a further sense in which uh, the um, fundamental theory is non-spatial temporal with respect to general relativity and then with respect to quantum general relativity because you have to show how the entities that are fundamental in general relativity and quantum general relativity emerge themselves 
from uh, a different type of entities, the non-spatial temporal ones. This extra step can be called uh, uh, just as an intuitive label, a continuum limit. But the, the only point here uh, is that uh, it has to be understood that to be a different process, a different type of approximation compared to uh, classical, uh, to a classical limit. It's not just that uh, you have an entity described at the quantum level, you take a classical approximation and then it becomes uh, described at the classical level. It's really a different type of entities which after some appropriate uh, um, collective dynamics will become this, um, translated into still quantum uh, space-time entities and then you may have a further classical approximation to take. So this is a very general uh, um, set of statements I, I realize. Of course, uh, one has to look at the specific uh, uh, formalism to really uh, appreciate uh, the degree of non-spatial temporality of the fundamental entities, because it depends on how many of the features of space-time in general activity are in fact not present in the fundamental description in this uh, uh, proposed uh, formalism. In any case, the, the moment you change uh, fundamental degrees of freedom, you are at uh, uh, you have to face uh, what, I, what I label the level one of space-time emergence. So there is, in a sense, uh, there is an even more radical new metaphysics uh, that is needed, and there are a bunch of more uh, different conceptual issues that you have to tackle to understand the emergence of uh, space-time and the nature of space-time if. A theory of this type is the fundamental one. So again, schematically, it's like you have new entities, uh, which uh, pictorially you can uh, call uh, quantum gravity atoms. You have to take some limit, uh, some approximation to have a notion of uh, uh, continuum structures. And you have to be able to control this collective dynamics uh, and if you're able to control it uh, fully, then you have full quantum gravity. At, that, at which point you may try to translate uh, to a quantum generativistic description of uh, space-time. So I give you an example of a formalism which I would classify to be in this category and it's called tensorial group field theories for quantum gravity. Of course, I just give you some elements uh, most of the details are not so not very important. So, and in particular, I don't discuss the general formalism. It's, it's in fact quite broad, but uh, I focus on specific models within the formalism, which are quantum geometric in some sense and are more uh, directly applicable to um, uh, quantum gravity. So, basic idea you can imagine the fundamental entities as uh, uh, little uh, um, simplices quantized tetrahedra so they are quantum entities each of which has the type of degrees of freedom that you would attribute uh, to a single simplex uh, so you can speak of uh, the uh, volume the area of the surfaces uh, the uh, length of the edges of such uh, uh, little building blocks uh, but of course, it's just a sort of a pictorial representation of the degrees of freedom in the same sense in which uh, the, uh, an electron is not uh, a little uh, spinning ball uh, um, that you, that you uh, can really describe in such uh, classical looking uh, terms. So there is uh, some underlying classical uh, phase space, uh, some classical um, uh, data attributed to each of them and you can quantize the same data and have a Hilbert space associated to each such uh, building block. Uh, uh, the, the whole uh, geometric data of these building blocks uh, can be described in uh, uh, group theoretic variables so you end up having wave functions for each of them which are just functions over a group manifold normally just SU2 or SO3. You can also express it in uh, uh, conjugate variables, uh, and these are just the uh, irreducible representations 
of the group. If you're using SU2, it just spins. So take this uh, just uh, the basic uh, dynamical variables for a single atom of space. Again, pictorially represented as a, sim a simplex, a three-dimensional simplex for quantum gravity models in four dimensions. Out of the Hilbert space for each quantum, for each atom, you can uh, construct a Fox space of an arbitrary collection of atoms. So you are basically trying to describe your theory as if it was uh, a quantum many-body system with each uh, object, each atom being uh, this uh, little geometric building block. And you can describe uh, every geometric quantity for, for a collection of such atoms, geometric atoms in terms of a usual second quantized uh, language. A generic state would be a collection of those building blocks, including uh, states uh, that you can interpret as uh, having glued together these building blocks uh, to form extended structures. What is interesting is that the gluing between them is in fact uh, at the technical level, it's just the entanglement between the degrees of freedom attributed to each of the two uh, building blocks. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, fundamental uh, entities that the formalism deals with. It's quite clear that they're not uh, quantized continuum geometries in any obvious sense. First of all, because you don't need to connect them. Uh, so you have states that correspond to uh, objects which are disconnected. Second, because even when you connect them and you take a classical approximation, what you get is not uh, some uh, continuum uh, space, but you get at best, in some cases, uh, uh, a piecewise flat type uh, uh, geometry. So you're still far away from uh, usual continuum uh, geometries. So there is some more work to be done. So in this sense, uh, they're not spatial temporal. They are very similar, in fact, to the type of states uh, that are used, uh, that are found in loop quantum gravity upon canonical quantization of the classical theory. So may I, I spend just a couple of words uh, to, to illustrate the differences, because it's an example of how uh, similar structures uh, can, in fact, have different degrees of non-spatial temporality. So the key point is that you can see the uh, loop quantum gravity states, uh, the spin networks associated to connected uh, graphs uh, as entangled quantum many-body states uh, in this uh, tensorial groovy theory formalism. So in fact, you can embed the, the Hilbert space that loop quantum gravity defines uh, associated to a given connected graph. You can faithfully embed it uh, in the uh, tensorial group field theory Fox space. However, then you construct the Fox space by considering all possible number of uh, uh, building blocks, uh, vertices, and imposing uh, uh, bosonic uh, statistics of so permutation symmetry. The full Hilbert space instead of canonical loop quantum gravity, although it has the same type of structures, the same type of degrees of freedom, is constructed differently. And the, uh, without going into details, uh, the point is that uh, the differences reflect uh, the requirements uh, in loop quantum gravity to stay close uh, to uh, a theory of a continuum connection, which is the starting point. So, uh, the theory ends up being non-spatial temporal anyway, but in a different degree, in a, in a different uh, uh, technical manner uh, as compared to uh, tensorial group field theories. Okay. The dynamics, uh, so the, a full model uh, for such uh, uh, non-spatial temporal entities is given by choice of action and the construction of a partition function. If you expand the partition function in uh, uh, perturbative series, so in Feynman diagrams, the sort of elementary processes between these uh, uh, interaction processes among these building blocks, well, what you find out is that they, they generate uh, uh, processes which are in 
direct correspondence with lattices, four-dimensional lattices. Moreover, the Feynman amplitudes of these models are in fact lattice gravity path integrals. So you can relate them to gravity at this discrete level. And they're in fact also rewritten, can be, they can be rewritten as so-called spin form models, which is another way of trying to define a dynamics for the spin networks of loop quantum gravity. So let me just say that uh, uh, at this uh, perturbative level, the relation to gravity is under control, but at a discrete level. So in a discrete sense, you may connect the theory to discrete quantum gravity. Um, the point is that uh, the theory is not just this uh, perturbative level, luckily, because we, uh, it's, uh, the, the problem becomes to how to reconstruct a notion of a continuum space-time, still quantum, as uh, uh, would result uh, from the quantization of uh, general relativity. So the level one, as I said, is the level of issues you reach when you uh, decide that the fundamental entities are not directly quantum continuum uh, uh, fields. And I said that in order to recover a continuum description of space-time still at the quantum level, you need to take some sort of continuum limit. We know, however, that from quant in quantum many-body systems, uh, there's no such thing as the continuum limit. There are many continuum limits because quantum many-body systems in a continuum limit organize into different continuum phases. And in the quantum gravity case, we could expect that not all phases are going to be spatiotemporal, meaning not all phases will allow for an even approximate reconstruction of a continuum space-time. Of course, at least one of them must allow for this, otherwise the theory is wrong because we cannot recover general relativity, but uh, there's no guarantee that all of them will. So they will have, they, we will have different phases with different effective quantum dynamics and, and different classical approximations. And only one of them has to be uh, uh, related to space-time as we know it, or to space-time at all, in fact. In this sense, one can say that the fundamental entities of the theory are even less spatiotemporal than in a situation in which only one phase in the continuum limit would emerge. So this forces us to consider a number of other issues and to attribute uh, a different uh, ontological status uh, to the fundamental entities. That's why I call it uh, level two of space-time emergence a different set of issues uh, uh, has to be dealt with. So the picture is more complicated than what, I, what I've shown. From the same quantum gravity atoms in an appropriate uh, collective continuum limit, still at the quantum level, we, are, we, are, we should expect to reach, uh, to be able to reach different continuum phases only one of which has to be related to quantum general relativity, a so-called geometric phase. Now, you may of course treat uh, all this multiplicity of phases uh, uh, and maybe even the uh, quantum, at quantum gravity atoms themselves are just technical artifacts, tools to actually recover quantum general relativity. But if you instead take them uh, to be physical, then different phases may have to be physical, may, may, may have to be taken as physical themselves. And then phase transitions separating them could be understood as being physical. This is the idea of geometrogenesis, so that uh, uh, the phase transition from a non-spatial temporal to a spatial temporal phase is not just uh, 
a technical aspect of the theory, but is a, something physical in the sense to be uh, understood. So first of all, you have to guess, try to guess what sort of physics may correspond to this phase transition. And an obvious guess is that it has to do with the cosmological singularity when uh, you know, our intuition would uh, suggest that uh, space and time uh, come into being, come into existence. And then you can ask a more physicist type question. So what sort of signature of such uh, um, geometrogenesis phase transition we may hope uh, to see in observations? The moment you start asking this set of questions at the physical and conceptual level, then you are at level three of space-time emergence. There are new issues about uh, the fundamental non-spatio-temporal level of reality that you have to face. And of course, there are many, and I'm happy to discuss uh, uh, with you uh, any of these questions. So the uh, new element is the fact that there are some transitions from one phase to another that deserve and require some uh, understanding too. So the whole literature on uh, uh, space-time emergence, both the physics, uh, physical uh, quantum gravity and the conceptual level, philosophical level, uh, should better consider also these uh, possibilities. And in fact, that they are starting to, con they, are, they are considering all of them, not necessarily in the language uh, I expressed it, but uh, in, uh, in, in a number of related ones. Okay, there is of course uh, another possible path. Uh, you can try to take a classical limit first from your quantum space-time atoms, you, where you expect to get some, for, some sort of classical discrete geometry, and then you take a continuum limit. Uh, then of course it's fine uh, to reach uh, general relativity. The, the issue with this uh, is that uh, we have no guarantee, and in fact, we should not expect the two paths to commute. So continuum, then classical, uh, and the other class, uh, classical, then continuum. We should not expect them to commute. And the experience we have from uh, quantum many body system says that you know, it's the first one that uh, should be given priority. Although, of course, in, in some cases, for some purposes, the second one could also work. One example being, I don't know, uh, superfluids. If you were first taking a classical limit of your atoms and then study the continuum fluid dynamics, you will miss uh, superfluidity because that is actually due to the quantum properties of the microscopic uh, system. Okay, let's move on. So disappearance of space and time into something more primitive. How would this type of issues be, uh, be tackled in the tensorial group field theory formalism? I said you have a quantum field theory for the atoms of space. Ideally, you want to just compute the full uh, quantum dynamics of such field theory for some appropriate model. This would be full quantum gravity. And uh, you can try and you can uh, uh, go a long way along this uh, uh, optimistic uh, path because you have a number of new tools uh, coming from the quantum field theory language that you can adapt uh, to quantum gravity. And in fact, a lot of work has been done along this uh, um, line of reasoning. Uh, controlling the continuum limit means, uh, for example, identifying inequivalent quantum representations of the fundamental uh, algebra of observables. It means uh, resumming the perturbative series. It means uh, studying the non-perturbative uh, renormalization group flow of the theory and trying to map uh, the continuum phase diagram. So this is a very active line of research, actually several uh, directions of research. And I just summarize uh, the few things we learned uh, 
in some generali generality from all this work. Most of the work has been done in simpler models than the one I, uh, I'm going to deal with uh, in the following. But uh, there are hints uh, of uh, phase transitions. So in general, indeed, uh, there is a confirmation that the phase diagram is rich. And uh, uh, there is some suggestions that uh, you really need uh, either non-compact uh, group manifold uh, to uh, have a non-trivial phase diagram or, or and additional matte degrees of freedom. And in fact, we are going to see in the following that uh, we need matte degrees of freedom for another reason too. As I said, ideally, we would compute uh, the full uh, partition function or the full uh, free energy or the full quantum effective action. Um, in practice, of, of course, uh, we need approximations to do that. And we need approximations that go beyond the, the sum over Feynman diagrams, uh, the sum over microscopic uh, discrete processes, because we want to capture collective effects from the point of view of the uh, building blocks of space time. And uh, the approximation has to correspond to some sort of coarse graining of these fundamental discrete uh, atoms. And uh, we want to maintain as much as possible the quantum nature of the fundamental entities. So the simplest approximation of this type is just to consider uh, mean field hydrodynamics. So to basically approximate the full path integral with the subtle points or the full quantum effective action with the classical action. Now, uh, I, let me make a, one more remark and then I, I, I make a, a comment about this. So this is a good starting point as the simplest, uh, the simplest approximation is also a good starting point for improving the approximation uh, by means of uh, randomization group methods. Because the randomization group flow uh, is in fact understood as going from the classical action towards the full quantum effective action as you remove uh, your uh, cutoff indicating the scale at which uh, you are computing things. Uh, it's basically the type of approximation you, of uh, the fundamental degrees of freedom you are, uh, you are using. Now, the comment I wanted to make is that it may seem uh, paradoxical that uh, I say you want to keep uh, as much as possible the quantum nature of the fundamental uh, entities and then I say, you can try to work at the mean field uh, uh, level, which is basically the classical action. But the classical action from the point of view of the building blocks uh, is in fact a quantum um, uh, construction. You can just imagine uh, a system of uh, photons and uh, the classical electromagnetism from the point of view of the photons is in fact the result of taking a highly uh, quantum state in which you have an infinite superposition of uh, uh, coherent photons all with the same wave function. So it's, uh, that's how in fact how you take a classical limit from, uh, to recover electromagnetism from a theory of photons. But it's a classical limit from the point of view of the field and a quantum configuration from the point of view of the photons. Okay, so this is the general picture. And now I try to tell you something more the, about how you reconstruct, uh, how you can try to reconstruct quantum general relativity from uh, a partial continuum limit. So from an approximate continuum description of the theory. So we, we take this mean field approximation and we, and we use it to reconstruct uh, some effective gravitational spatial temporal dynamics. So the strategy is to look for a continuum space time in the collective dynamics. The hypothesis is that we have to look at the condensate phase, so this type of mean field hydrodynamics. So the hydrodynamic description is the one that will allow us to have some effective continuum space-time. The intuition 
from the point of view is that the universe from the point of view of the uh, uh, fundamental entities the atoms of quantum gravity is a sort of a condensate of them and the dynamical variable we're going to use is the mean field which is basically the condensate wave function so you can obtain it this mean field condensate description from the fundamental fox space description by just using uh, this uh, special coherent states for the field operator and again this is exactly what you do with photons uh, to recover uh, classical electromagnetism so let's explore this uh, picture of space-time as emerging from uh, uh, a description of the uh, universe in terms of a condensate of the quantum gravity atoms and we are going to see that uh, is a cosmological dynamics that we extract from the quantum gravity hydrodynamics however before uh, doing so we should recall that already at the classical level i argued that uh, we need uh, a relational procedure for reconstructing a notion of space-time that is diffeomorphism invariant and for that we need some appropriate uh, math degree of freedom uh, for convenience uh, to play the role of clock and rods so we work now with the uh, models in which uh, you have this uh, little geometric uh, uh, simplices as your atoms of space but they are coupled with an additional degree of freedom that from the point of view of discrete gravity can be understood as a single free massless uh, scalar field. So we work with models uh, that uh, at the pure gravity level we reproduce a lattice gravity path integral. And when you add this degree of freedom, we reproduce uh, a lattice gravity path integral for gravity coupled to a simple scalar field. So it's like having, uh, in practice, it means having an additional real variable in your domain for the tensorial groovy theory field. You have the same non-spatial temporal character that I already uh, discussed for the pure geometric case. You can extend the definition of your condensate uh, coherent states, and you have uh, uh, an appropriate action that will guarantee this interpretation at the discrete level. What do you do now with this model? Well, you want to go at the hydrodynamic level. So you want to approximate the full quantum theory for such a, an extended field um, in an hydrodynamic, in fact, mean field approximation. We should expect that uh, we are going to deal only with global geometric quantities from the spatial point of view. And we have a single scalar field value. That, uh, so we can use it as a relational clock, but the only type of uh, uh, effective space time that we can reconstruct is a homogeneous type uh, of space of geometry. And so the effective dynamics we may try to reconstruct at first with this type of data at our disposal is homogeneous cosmology. And this is uh, can be uh, this intuition can be supported by the fact that if you look at the condensate wave function for such states, the domain of the wave function is in fact isomorphic to the uh, so-called mini superspace of homogeneous geometries. The type of uh, configurations that uh, the quantum cosmology wave function will depend on. So you, we, our basic dynamical variable being the condensate wave function will be in fact a function on the space of homogeneous geometries, just like in quantum cosmology. And in fact, uh, the general equations of motion, the hydrodynamic, uh, in fact, gross pitaesque equations for the condensate wave function that we extract from the full dynamics, uh, take the form of a nonlinear quantum cosmology equation. Nonlinear because it's hydrodynamics. Uh, and in fact, uh, you have interactions of your microscopic uh, building blocks uh, 
which at the collective level give you a nonlinear term in the condensate wave function. So you extract something that is formally like quantum cosmology for a wave function of the universe. But however, you have also some nonlinear term in your dynamics. This means that uh, there's no Hilbert space structures for solutions of such equation. So there's no Hilbert space associated to the cosmological wave function. There is of course a fundamental Hilbert space, which is the Fox space of your atoms, but uh, nothing at this level, not at this level. Anyway, this type of mean field approximation should be understood, uh, should be expected to be valid uh, when interactions are small. And uh, at the same time, uh, your uh, number of quanta, uh, the average number of quanta is not too small because again, it's uh, hydrodynamics. So you don't do hydrodynamics with uh, two atoms. Okay, so this is just to clarify a little bit more the sort of approximation we, we should understand uh, to be uh, there for the scheme to be uh, plausible. Okay, now let's see uh, more concretely what sort of effective dynamics we get, how we extract an effective uh, relational cosmological dynamics and what basic lessons we have for the emergence of uh, space-time. Well, we sp I specialize uh, to a, a particular class of uh, models and I do two more approximations. One is that I impose uh, what from the cosmological point of view is uh, isotropy. In practice, it means that uh, the wave function will depend only on two variables, a single geometric uh, variable, the J, a spin, and uh, the value of your clock, the scalar field. Well, the would be clock. And that's fine for homogeneous isotropic uh, cosmology. Then again, you have to assume that the interactions are subdominant, but the, the interactions in, in the models have to be anyway weak, otherwise you don't trust the perturbative uh, lattice gravity interpretation of the same models. Now, in principle, no, we have everything to reconstruct full continuum uh, space-time physics for homogeneous uh, setting. But again, we need to recast everything in a relational language. So we want our uh, coarse-grained uh, dynamical degree of freedom uh, chi, the one introduced as a matte degree of freedom, to play the role of a clock, a relational clock. This itself should be understood to be possible only in an approximate sense, because it's a quantum degree of freedom, so a priori will not behave as a good clock. So we have to select a, a subclass of states, of uh, fundamental states in the theory that uh, allow a good peaking property on a value of the clock, at least in expectation value. So uh, these are uh, peaked condensate wave functions. And uh, uh, so that fluctuations in the value in the reading of your clock are very, very small. So we are going to have an effective relational dynamics, uh, which is effective for two reasons, because it follows from a coarse graining of the fundamental entities, but also because it means that it requires neglecting some of the physical features of a realistic clock, which is that it's a quantum system itself. So we do that. And this is the equation we extract. The equation, of course, uh, is an equation for the reduced uh, condensate wave function evaluated uh, at a time, at a certain reading of the clock. And the derivatives are indeed the derivatives with respect to this reading of the clock. So they are time derivatives with respect to the uh, clock. The equation depends on a number of parameters that follow from the microscopic parameters of the theory. So the fundamental dynamics you have chosen, the choice of quantum state, uh, and the approximation made on the clock. 
we can recast the equation in a more standard hydrodynamic language by introducing the density of the uh, condensate, uh, the fluid, and the uh, phase or velocity of the fluid. And now this is the effective hydrodynamic equation out of which we want to reconstruct a spatial temporal picture. In order to do that, we have to use now observables which correspond to uh, geometric quantities expressed in relational language. So we do that. These observables are going to be computed in the fundamental theory, in the fundamental Fox space, but uh, used in expectation values in the special class of uh, uh, coarse grained states uh, uh, we're using. So that's the reconstruction procedure from a candidate geometric phase, a condensate phase, to hopefully quantum generativity. We define uh, the key observables uh, needed uh, to reconstruct cosmology. So the total volume of the universe, which are going to, is going to give us the scale factor, the scalar field, the value of the scalar field, and the uh, momentum of the scalar field. If you compute their expectation values in the special class of uh, uh, clock states uh, I introduced, we have a notion of volume and number operator at a given time of uh, uh, indeed the uh, clock reading and momentum of the scalar field at a given time. And then we plug, uh, we rewrite uh, the hydrodynamic equation for the condensate wave function as an equation for the volume in relational time. So the prime derivative is again derivative with respect to the clock reading from uh, with respect to the relational time. So you get some equations and we analyze, first of all, that we are able to reproduce classical generativistic equations for the uh, universe volume in an appropriate regime. Indeed, in, this re in, in a classical approximation, which more or less means uh, uh, large volumes, we recover the Friedman equation in relational time, which is the last equation uh, you can see on the right, under a sufficient condition that there is some dominant spin contribution to the wave function and that the corresponding coefficients entering the equations can be understood as an effective Newton constant. So the main lesson is that in such emergent space-time scenario, the usual gravitational parameters like Newton constants uh, and maybe cosmological constant, the other coupling constants of effective field theory are in fact functions of the fundamental couplings of the quantum gravity theory. And um, the form of the cosmological dynamics uh, depends on the choice of clock you have made. You should not expect that there is any invariance under different choices of clock. And the other thing you can do is to compute fluctuations of your observables. And you can check that uh, if the good clock conditions are satisfied, then uh, the volume fluctuations at large volumes are under control. So the classical limit is robust. So, so far you can trust these effective uh, uh, space-time dynamics. Then you look at what happens at small times clock readings, you find that uh, some solutions have singular behavior. So the cosmological singularity is not always generically resolved in this approximation. But uh, there is a large class of uh, um, states for which instead you have that the volume remains always positive at all times with a single turning point. So you basically have a bouncing universe scenario, resolving the classical singularity. And you can also check that quantum fluctuations remain small or can remain small under some conditions on the parameters of the model. And you can simplify this whole uh, um, 
evolution for the volume if you assume that uh, the wave function for the condensate uh, is only non-zero for a single value of the spin. And then you get a very simple equation and you can do, of course, uh, more calculations. But you see again the bounds, uh, you can compute the minimal value of the volume and you can compute fluctuations. And you can see from the, uh, looking at the fluctuations that the number density cannot be too small uh, be because as you would expect, uh, uh, in, uh, in an hydrodynamic approximation, if the number density becomes too small, fluctuations grow out of control. And in fact, yeah, you don't trust the hydrodynamic approximation anymore. This would be important in a second when I uh, discuss a possible uh, physical meaning of uh, geometrogenesis. Okay, there are, uh, there are a lot, so quite some friends are working on this uh, um, framework and so there are a number of results. I want to mention only a few, only two or three. One is that you can use this clock uh, to deparameterize uh, the theory at the classical level and then you obtain a standard Hamiltonian system uh, like a, you know, a field theory for your condensate with some Hamiltonian evolution and a more standard uh, gross pitaeski equation. You can extend the formalism to cosmological perturbations. And so, but in order to do that, you have to add the degrees of freedom to play the role of rods, relational uh, definition of space. And you can compute the effect of the uh, interactions of your fundamental building blocks. And uh, you can do it for very simplified models only because the interactions are quite complicated. But there is one general lesson we, we, we can draw from uh, this uh, uh, preliminary work, which is that in an emergent space-time scenario, large scale properties of the universe could be of direct quantum gravity origin. For example, we seem to be obtaining a, a viable dark energy um, um, universe, dark energy dominated universe at late times due to the fundamental interactions. Okay, and now I uh, close. I need only five more minutes if I can. Yes, of course. Uh, I'm not keeping track of uh, the exact time, but I hope I can use just uh, five minutes. So I want to discuss two points. One is uh, what we can say about the fate of the cosmological singularity in this specific emergent space-time scenario, hoping that there is some more general validity. And the second is, uh, uh, I will discuss uh, whether we can in fact discuss level three of emergence and uh, try to say something about the possible physics uh, and the physical nature of the phase transition leading to the geometric phase, the condensate phase. So here we have seen a bounce, but we have also mentioned the possibility that a phase transition is what really replaces the cosmological singularity in quantum gravity? Well, so far we have seen a bounce. So it's nice, it's a similar result to what is obtained in loop quantum gravity, but is obtained uh, loop quantum cosmology, but is obtained uh, in, uh, in a uh, tentative complete quantum gravity theory. However, one has to be precise with the statement. We find that the classical cosmological singularity is replaced by a big bounce scenario in a mean field restriction of the hydrodynamic approximation and within a condensate phase. So mean field, uh, of course, it's a very drastic approximation, so we should improve. It could be that uh, you know, uh, this spoils the bouncing scenario, but it could be that the bouncing scenario is instead stable. And then yes, we would have a cosmic quantum bounce uh, even after improvement of the hydrodynamic approximation, but we're still in an hydrodynamic approximation and we're still assuming that the quantum system we're dealing with stays within a condensate phase. The hydrodynamic approximation can break down for a number of reasons. Uh, and this would, lead, uh, would mean that there's no bounds really, which is too much of a spatial temporal picture, but there is a more radical disappearance of uh, uh, our continuum space-time notions. If the system leaves, uh, in fact, dynamically 
the uh, geometric phase, then uh, uh, there is an even more radical disappearance of continuous space time. And for one more reason, uh, the bouncing scenario is not valid. And this would be the scenario of uh, geometrogenesis. So we don't know yet. The jury is still uh, out to decide uh, between the two possibilities. So let's say something about uh, the uh, possibility of geometrogenesis as a physical process. Try to give it a physical characterization and maybe a prototemporal type uh, characterization. And I have to alert you that I'm, now I'm really in a guessing mode. Uh, I'm not even into, you know, I, I try to take lessons from actual results. I'm really guessing. So that's the general picture. And now we focus on the transitions, possible transitions between phases. Well, let's say, uh, let's just make a couple of general considerations about phase transitions. In the usual context of equilibrium statistical mechanics, strictly speaking, also in usual physics, there's no time and there are no processes because we are at equilibrium. Uh, so there we understand phase transitions as a non-analytic behavior of your partition function of your system. And you will see that in uh, divergences in number of observables and fluctuations growing. And uh, there are many signatures of this non-analytic behavior. But we cannot really understand phase transitions in such a context as processes, unless we have in mind uh, some external agent who is tuning the coupling constants. Otherwise, uh, the only way to move uh, across the phase diagram is uh, the renormalization group flow, because it allows you, by considering the same system at different scales of approximation, to move uh, across uh, the space of coupling constants. And you don't have to introduce any agent. Uh, and you don't have to consider any uh, agent uh, external to the system. So this is one particular context, the simplest one. But I, I want to point out that there are other ways of doing statistical mechanics, uh, like non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, in which uh, phase transitions in fact are dynamical processes because you have some clear notion of time with respect to which uh, they, uh, you see the evolution of your system, including the evolution of couplings. In the tensorial group field theory setting that, we, uh, that I discussed uh, uh, so far, we are in fact uh, in the quantum gravity analog of equilibrium statistical mechanics. The partition function of the system was uh, uh, defined using a generalized notion of equilibrium uh, and generalizing to quantum gravity ideas uh, that have been developed in the context of uh, generally covariant statistical mechanics. So here there was no external time that is needed nor possible like in equilibrium. Uh, it's not needed just like in uh, usual equilibrium statistical mechanics. It's not even possible because the system you're talking about is some quantum version of general relativity or something even more radical. So clearly there's no external time you can use. So we adopted the relational strategy, but it had to be a relational strategy for given coupling constants because they were defined once and for all in your definition of the partition function of the fundamental system. So now we consider the hypothesis that geometrogenesis corresponds to the classical geometric singularity, cosmological singularity. And that it will manifest itself in the growth of fluctuations close to the bouncing region. We take the simplest case of effective cosmological dynamics we have a formula for the quantum fluctuations. And indeed, we can see that uh, there are functions, this, this uh, minimum, sorry, this maximum of the fluctuations which are reached uh, at the bounds uh, is a function of the couplings of the theory, the effective Newton constant, which is itself uh, a function of the fundamental couplings of the theory. So you can imagine that the 
uh, critical regime in which the hydrodynamic approximation breaks down is in fact uh, a critical value for the fundamental coupling constants. So indeed the phase transition of the fundamental system. From the randomization group point of view, you can try to consider these couplings as running, and then you can do the following uh, um, reasoning. You can, you want to give a sort of prototemporal characterization of the phase transition. For doing this, you want to relate the scale of the randomization group uh, parameter to the degrees of freedom that we interpret as uh, uh, geometric or clock ones. The scale is in fact a cutoff in some combination of them Let's take the simplifying assumption that it just uh, a cut off uh, in the uh, volume of the universe. The volume reaches a minimum. This minimum to be compatible with observations uh, cannot be too large. It has to be roughly Planckian. So the cutoff has to be roughly small in terms of the volume. So the critical regime that we identified before would be reached dynamically, so in a sort of uh, evolution type way across uh, the evolution of the universe, if uh, it corresponds to the cutoff of your uh, randomization group flow uh, going towards zero to small values. If you find that in such limit, in such approximation, the critical conditions are approached for the fluctuations, then what the, the theory is telling you is that indeed the fluctuations are growing because uh, the system is approaching, possibly approaching a phase transition. So this is how you could see from within the effective cosmological description that you are in fact approaching geometrogenesis instead of having a proper bounds. Okay, I close it here and uh, uh, I just emphasize that this is uh, a conjectural scenario in a context that could well be too restrictive. Maybe the correct way to do is to try to generalize to a relational type of uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And there are many other conceptual issues that uh, I'll be happy to discuss. So thank you very much and sorry for taking a bit Your longer. Turn. So. Let's start. The very first in line is Eric Curiel. So please, Eric, go ahead. Daniele, th uh, thank you for that marvelous talk. I have, a, I have a comment and a question. The comment is, I'm a little, although it's very common in, um, in this area to talk about resolving singularities, I'm a little uncomfortable with that way of putting the issue because in, in presumably one means resolve the, a, the singularity as it's characterized in classical GR. A singularity in classical GR is generally speaking characterized as an, as an incomplete and extendable causal geodesic. Any causal geodesic running into your, uh, uh, in, into the balance region. I mean, the, the balance region is even when it's, even when the condensate phase is still a good approximation Presumably, there there are still going to be some uh, quantum gravity effects, as you um, as you mentioned. So I I doubt that causal geodesics running into that region are going to be are going to be unambiguously extendable. So in effect, you still have incomplete and extendable geodesics, just for a different reason than you do in classical GR. So um, I I think that for for mm -hmm. conceptual clarity, perhaps you, um, maybe we should talk about something other than resolving the singularity. Uh, that, but... yeah, yeah, I'm, fi I'm fine with any better choice of, te of uh, terminology. Yeah, uh, uh, my understanding of what uh, I mean, what I should mean by resolving a singularity is that uh, any observable quantity I try to compute, uh, I can actually compute it. <laughs> and that of those uh, with uh, spatial temporal uh, characterization. So well, that... uh, in practice, it would mean that uh, the quantum fluctuations, if present, uh, are not, uh, you know, the relative quantum fluctuations are small. That could lead us into doesn't a... mean that it's going to behave uh, classically in, uh, in any sense. That could lead us into a whole other argument, because I'm not sure I entirely yeah, know. 
but I'll but I'll put it aside because I really want to ask a different I really want to ask a different question, yeah. which is that um, so what when you were constructing um, the your effective clock um, using the scalar field, you had to put the matter degrees of freedom more or less in by hand, so to speak, at an intermediate stage in order to make sure that what gets what emerges at the end is really a you know is a is a massive scalar. Field. Uh, I wouldn't say so. I, so in, in, in several sense, in several for several reasons. Okay. First of all, uh, it is put by hand uh, just as well, just as much uh, as uh, the geometric uh, notions are put in by hand. In the sense that the fundamental uh, uh, atoms, uh, the fundamental entities, uh, have a number of data that you can interpret uh, at the discrete level as uh, you know discrete geometry and uh, discretized uh, matter fields mm -hmm. so in this sense you are starting from something that you choose you construct uh, appropriately so that you can uh, use a certain interpretation mm -hmm. but i also emphasize that uh, for the same reasons why you cannot speak of those degrees of freedom on the geometry side mm -hmm. as a space time in any usual uh, sense and there is a lot of work to reconstruct uh, a standard notion of geometry, the same applies uh, equally to the degree of freedom that I interpret as a discrete uh, proto scalar field uh, degrees of freedom. So that they're really on equal footing. That actually is um, is grist for my for my mill. That's exactly where I was going. I wanted to press you on whether there was any distinction between. But you're smart, so. <laughs> you, you, I, I wanted to press you on whether there was any distinction between gravitational and material degrees of freedom at the fundamental level. At, at, at that level, yes, so there is a subset, there is a distinction between different sets of degrees of freedom. Whether, uh, uh, say, matter is only emerging from uh, the subset that you already identified the discrete matter, whether there's no messing up uh, in the continuum process, uh, in the continuum approximation, that's a different story. But there is a a partition of your fundamental degrees of freedom into subsets that at the discrete level indeed behave like matter and uh, geometry. I find that really hard to believe because e because give, give, given that um, that gradients of the stress energy tensor are proportional to the vial tensor and we normally think of the vial tensor as encoding kind of pure gravitational degrees of freedom. I don't see how, you're, how you can possibly get a clean separation of matter and gravitational degrees of freedom at the, at the basic level. Yeah, that's, that's why I don't expect it. Okay. That's why I said, so, I mean, at the discrete level, you you have, you have need to have uh, enough degrees of freedom that you can construct observables that you try to interpret uh, the continuum level in uh, geometric spatial temporal terms. Okay. The effective dynamics uh, doesn't have to preserve any distinction uh, in, in, I can give an example. We are, we are, as, as, as I mentioned towards the end of the talk, we are studying, for example, the, the effect of the interactions or the microscopic interactions at this hydrodynamic level after we rewrite them in cosmological uh, terms. So the fundamental interactions among the atoms of uh, the formalism, the GFT, and we try to see if the effective cosmology uh, is how it is modified by the presence of such interactions. So without the with the interactions being subdominant, we find uh, Friedman in some semi-classical regime with uh, fluctuations and so on. With the interaction, I said that we find some effective dark energy. Now the effective dark energy, in fact, we can rewrite it as if it was an additional scalar field, exactly this uh, one of these billions of models that are used by cosmologists you know you add the scalar field whenever you don't understand something and uh, but in our context uh, we didn't add any new degree of freedom it's the same degrees of freedom that we were interpreting as geometric that in fact produce an effective dynamics that look like a geometry plus some weird scalar field okay thank you. Uh, that's very helpful thank you Thanks. Next in line, we have uh, Pedro Naranjo. Pedro. So yeah, thanks, uh, Daniela, for this uh, <laughs> impressive amount of information. So uh, I actually have two questions, but I leave uh, just one in case I I have the chance for just to allow another uh, people to to have the opportunity to ask. So one of the things is uh, regardless is uh, more conceptual. It, it, because you emphasize throughout the talk that 
uh, basically your your fundamental elements, uh, this uh, quantum gravity atom space, are sort of uh, beyond what is usually in in in, in the quantum cosmology. So it, uh, it, even less non-spatial temporal. So uh, just as um, what sort of uh, I kind of think that you hinted at, but what sort of uh, basically emergence from that state, say from this uh, your quantum atom space towards this geometric phase that you speak. Uh, so are you speaking of uh, some sort of functional uh, uh, emergence in that sense? Um, or because if you start over with uh, basically not even, so not special temporal elements at all. So for example, you, you have to get rid of, well, you don't have uh, the disposal any notion of causality for, for that matter. So uh, what sort of uh, emergence I, in, in this particular? Yeah, so I was, uh, yeah, okay, it was so let's separate of... two issues. One is that to, to show the full emergence of space-time, you need to have uh, enough degrees of freedom, enough observables to really characterize a local uh, space-time structure and curvature and uh, different type of matter fields and so on. It's really, you're, you, you have to tackle head-on the problem of observables in classical general relativity because you need to have observables that uh, have a local interpretation and that diffeomorphism invariant. So, okay, let's set that aspect aside. If you were, if you were able to compute an effective dynamics for many such observables, then you will probably face the usual problem of writing them down at the quantum level uh, in terms of functional analysis and so on. That's, uh, that's one part of the story. But in order to characterize uh, why I'm saying that the building blocks of the fundamental entities in uh, tensorial group theory are even less spatial temporal than, for example, the quantum states uh, of uh, the spin networks in loop quantum gravity. Uh, you, can, you can compare the Hilbert spaces of the two, and you know you see that they're different. And uh, in particular, in the construction of the uh, loop quantum gravity spin network uh, Hilbert space, the number of conditions that your states have to satisfy uh, called uh, cylindrical equivalence uh, relations, which, uh, okay, the technical aspect is not important, but there are additional restrictions on uh, that determine the relation among different states and how they encode the, the, the fundamental uh, data that follow from the requirement that uh, you are representing in terms of such states uh, a continuum uh, gravitational connection. So there are some properties that the connection and its holonomies would have to satisfy in the continuum, part of which become conditions that your quantum states have to encode. This type of conditions are absent in, uh, in, in the spin networks as described in tensorial group theory. So the general point is simply that you, in order to appreciate different uh, um, degrees of spatial temporality, you have to consider different uh, properties of continuum uh, spatial temporal fields uh, and see which of them is or is not uh, implemented in your uh, fundamental entities. And then you can have uh, you know, a different degrees of uh, non-spatial temporality, depending on how many of such ingredients you are dropping. Okay. That's the point. So th there are some uh, technical restrictions, technical conditions in the construction of the loop quantum gravity states, which follow from requiring some spatial temporal properties, which maybe you need to, but uh, they're not present in uh, in the group field theory states. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I hope it helps. Yeah. Thank you. I Next in line, we have uh, Aaron Sloman. Aaron, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Is my microphone working okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question which comes from someone who really un understands a, s a small subset of what was said. My formal education in physics and mathematics ended about 60 years ago, and I've picked up many fragments since then. But I've been thinking a lot about aspects of life and intelligence 
and very recently started thinking about eggs, which I should have thought about long ago because I've known about them and you all know about them. You know that chickens can hatch out of eggs and ducks can hatch out of eggs and crocodiles and alligators and turtles and whatever. And one of the amazing things is how competent they are. If a chick comes out of its egg, first of all, it gets itself out, breaks open the shell and wiggles out and so on. And then immediately it can walk, it can see food and peck, it can drink very soon after, if not immediately, it can go to a chicken and um, follow the chicken. Now, um, the um, getting any robot to do any subset of that would require a huge amount of training. Uh, and I think most psychologists and neuroscientists and practically everybody else assumes that human and other animal spatial competences, the kind of intelligence I have, come from lots of training on examples which build up connections or whatever in brains. And none of that can happen to a chick because it's not exposed to any of the training material and yet it gets its competence, which to me shows that there's another more fundamental route, which depends on chemistry, the chemistry in the chick, which in turn depends on quantum mechanics, as I think Schrodinger sort of, he wrote his little book, What is Life in 1944, mainly focusing on the reliability of reproduction. And then he came back to quantum mechanics in life later. But as far as I know, he didn't think about the sorts of issues that I'm now talking about, and then I don't know of anybody else who has, maybe some people have, but the question I'm now going to end with is whether there are things either implied in the talk or known about in the, the, the field that could say something about the ways in which as the growing chick embryo becomes more complex with more and more parts that need to continue growing in relation to one another. And so that the control problems, for instance, setting up nerves and, and uh, blood vessels and um, uh, building structures like bones and muscles and making sure they're all in the right relationships to one another. And they're different from a chick and, and a duck and, a, and an alligator. So they're very specific. Can all, does, are there things about quantum mechanisms that might be capable, perhaps after more work than anybody has done yet, of explaining how all that control works, given that the control problems keep getting more and more complex, the more comp the controlling of the assembly get, keeps getting more complex as what's been assembled so far gets more complex. Does that make sense? Uh, there, there are several points. Uh, I'm not sure that any of them will, will directly answer, but uh, there, there are aspects of, of what you said uh, that, uh, um, that are certainly relevant uh, here. Um, so one is uh, very general, is the role of uh, uh, complexity and uh, measures of complexity in the um, in any process of emergence. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, the basic point is simply that uh, I try to emphasize the hypothesis or the, the idea that uh, space-time emerges uh, out of the collective behavior of uh, some fundamental entities. Now, this collective behavior requires uh, uh, enough complexity. There's no com collective behavior if you have uh, a very few uh, fundamental entities and, uh, and we're, we're not yet uh, explored enough uh, measures of complexity in our quantum gravity states at the fundamental level that could uh, you know somehow uh, um, help uh, characterize what type of states or what type of regime uh, allows for the reconstruction of uh, full uh, space-time. So the general idea is that space-time comes out of collective complex uh, behavior, but we didn't get yes, really explore that uh, uh, mathematically enough. Mm -hmm. uh, that, of course, is only very indirectly related to eggs and chickens, but uh, you know, uh, it's in the spirit. And uh, 
the other thing, however, so another point that I made towards the end, but uh, it, it needs to be explored, is that uh, the, all these processes in nature are in fact uh, strongly out of equilibrium. Now, if you really want to understand self-organized systems and you, you make the hypothesis that the universe is one such thing, then you need to develop a framework of out of equilibrium uh, evolution. And the problem, the main problem we are going to face is that if the system we're talking about is space time itself, just like the notion of equilibrium, also the notion of non equilibrium cannot be based on any pre existing absolute external notion of time. So we, we have to appropriately generalize the mathematics and the concept of out of equilibrium systems. Uh, where time is only an internal uh, degree of freedom, not an external one. It's not fixed. It's, and this uh, requires uh, more work. Uh, so this is in the optimistic, uh, positive uh, sense, mm -hmm. meaning, yes, I see the ideas. Uh, and uh, in fact, they are crucial. They, I expect them to be crucial also in our context. The third, uh, the third comment I can make in reply is that is on the negative side, because uh, in what is crucial for the evolution, for the uh, um, emergence of complex structure and uh, uh, in, uh, in biology is not just quantum mechanics, uh, and is not even uh, out of equilibrium uh, statistical mechanics or complex systems. Is uh, evolution, is a natural selection, and I'm not sure what the equivalent of that will be in in our case. So it's not enough to design. Uh, a good enough mechanism that out of complexity gives you richness. You need also a lot of selection pressure. And that I'm not sure what would be the counterpart in our case. Well, I, I think the selection pressures are different at different stages and in different evolutionary trajectories. So that's an additional complication. Uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not saying it cannot yeah. be done, it cannot yes. be modeled, or there's no counterpart. It's just that at the moment, I don't see yes. exactly what it would be. Yeah. Anyway, I think that uh, just one last uh, point about this. Uh, my impression, as someone who I, I don't have the detailed knowledge of physics and chemistry and so on, but I have quite a lot of experience of building computer programs, and I know about the difficulties of getting things to work together, and also uh, I think most people are dimly aware of the fact that we could not now build the systems we have, like the system that we're all using, Zoom and email systems and so on, if we depended only on physical machinery. We depend crucially on virtual machines that are implemented in a distributed way across a whole lot of physical components. Uh, and the Zoom system we're using is just one example among many of those, email and all sorts of things. And those virtual machines um, are very different from the earliest uh, kinds of computer programs that ran on a computer where you just had a whole lot of instructions and uh, the, the, the later developments allowed different kinds of machines with different kinds of instructions to implement to be implemented on the same underlying physics and I'm suggesting that something like that has has also been used by biological evolution, that there are different sorts of virtual machines that were discovered at different times and made use of uh, in evolution uh, in long different trajectories. And it's that, one- That I really don't know what the counterpart could be. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, it, it would be analogous to uh, a whole lot of physical laboratories which are in some sense at least as complex as all these things in Geneva and, and the States and so on, in terms of the number of parts and the different the varieties of things they can do. Um, but uh, still very complex on a much, much smaller scale. And um, uh, anyway, I, to me, that seems to be something we need to understand if we want to understand intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, next in line, we have uh, Lorenzo Maccone. Lorenzo, please go. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. So I have, Hi, Lorenzo. I have a, 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 first a, a, a rather stupid question, probably, but uh, 
in your level zero slide, you, you had this quantization in which you start from the metric G mu nu defined on uh, the space time xt, and then you quantize the metric G mu nu becomes an operator, but it's still defined on, on the space time x and t. And, and then I don't understand oh. how you can do that. No, no, okay, wait, there are two points. Maybe, maybe it's One just is, uh, a figurative uh, way. Okay, the first point, uh, in fact, uh, the first answer is uh, that just to mean that, that you quantize uh, the, the type of space-time degrees of freedom that you have in uh, general relativity. So you just try to map them to the quantum level. In that sense, you don't change the degrees of freedom. That was just mean, meant to to okay, it's, convey it's this general idea. Okay, okay. However, let me let me. There is one point you're making that I want to emphasize once more. Even in classical general relativity, okay. I would disagree that uh, uh, the domain of the metric or of the other fields has anything to do with space time per se. The manifold is not space-time because of diffeomorphism invariance. Sure. So in that I, sense, I, I, I wouldn't say I, that- I uh, was meaning the, the, the coordinates, uh, the coordinates, not- As space. well. So yeah. these are also not uh, physical in any sense that they can think exactly. of, unless exactly. in a, as a shortcut for something yeah. else. Exactly. So anyway, that point just meant, uh, you know, my point was just, uh, you know, you take uh, the degrees of freedom of some classical gravity theory and quantize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I suspected as much, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you. Then now for the real question. The, you, you were using a, a massless scalar field, uh, a free massless scalar field for, for the clock degree of freedom. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you instead want to do uh, as a relational uh, variable, if I understood correctly, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I was wondering if you would want to do the full space time uh, as a relational uh, uh, degree of freedom, would you would you need like four different scalar fields or, or yeah. like a spinorial field? Uh, what? You need at least a four more degree, uh, three more degrees of freedom. Right. So, so, so it's the in... simplest, uh, the simplest relational frame that I can think of that I've seen used in uh, in general relativity is in fact uh, for uh, free massless scalar fields. Okay. So, so otherwise it can be dust. Yes. Uh, it could be some other, but it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, anything that uh, is uh, rich enough uh, to have uh, four independent degrees of freedom that you can, in, in relation to which you can put uh, the metric, uh, the other fields and so on, will, will be a possible reference frame, a possible notion of event or point, uh, at least locally. Then, you know, if you take four scalar fields, but they're not free massless, they are highly interacting, they are quantum uh, and so on, then it's a very good, a very bad clock and a very bad uh, set of rods, but, uh, Thanks. And, and these fields are not defined on space-time, of course. They are defined on these quanta of... Uh... So it ju it's just like I was telling to Eric. So you need additional degree of freedom, but if you include these additional degrees of freedom in the fundamental level, they are as non-spatial temporal as the proto-geometric degrees of freedom. And, and you still need the full procedure and check that the effective continuum level, they start behaving like nice uh, space-time fields. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to go back to what uh, Pedro asked you a few minutes ago regarding this emergence of space-time mm -hmm. from a non spatial temporal regime. Now, mm -hmm. of course, you are a physicist. But uh, you know that there are also metaphysicians. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, because, I mean, in, in some sense, th th that doesn't, uh, let's say, bother you too much. But for a metaphysician, I think it is very important to clarify the nature of uh, this process by which we get space time from a non spatial temporal regime. Just talking about emergence is not enough for the metaphysician. That, that word is uh -huh. some sort of, uh, you know, placeholder. 
So no, a metaphysician but... would like to know more about, I don't know, is that a causal process? Is that uh, some sort of uh, ontological dependence? About mm -hmm. What sense it might be? So I saw that you put this kind of question among the ones sure. that you were open to this. Yeah, because I'm, because I'm a physicist, but I'm interested in those questions uh, as well. So what uh, is your take on uh, this, this problem? Uh, so my take uh, is, uh, uh, so my answer will be at two levels. So one, the first point is that a metaphysician, I would say, should be first of all working on what sort of ontology you can give to the fundamental entities if they're not spatio-temporal, even before worrying about uh, how space-time can emerge, unless you hope to clarify the ontology through a clarification of the process. But um, I'm not, that sounds to me like putting things uh, the, other, the, op, the, the other way around. And uh, in fact, I, I would say that uh, all this, the quantum gravity in general, in fact, even uh, at what I call level zero, uh, uh, calls uh, for uh, um, a lot of work uh, to develop a new metaphysics because uh, your ontology cannot be based on any spatial temporal notion. At least it should be much more uh, you know, loose uh, notion of space and time than we normally have. And, uh, and as far as I understand of metaphysics, uh, all the basics of, of ontology are in fact uh, heavily spatial temporal. So I would say that first of all, one is to worry about that aspect. Suppose that we clarify what the ontology of the fundamental entities is. Well, that what I can say about the process is that uh, the emergence process is that uh, clearly cannot be causal because again, causal, uh, if you intend physical causality, then it's also a spatial temporal notion. Uh, it cannot be a purely logical dependence, otherwise it would be close to a tautology, and then it's also not good. Uh, and so far, the only thing I can say is that I'm fine with uh, um, any ordered relation at which, along which uh, you find uh, novel uh, structures, and uh, that is also characterized by enough uh, uh, robustness of the conclusions. So I'm basically adopting the definition of emergence by Jeremy and Butterfield and other people, which is very loose, meaning that it's quite broad. It doesn't have to, it's not specific because uh, I believe uh, that a specific uh, definition of the emergent process requires a specific context. It has to come together with a, a, a template of how the thing should work uh, in a given formalism. I, I cannot, I should not try to characterize it uh, in general before having an example. Uh, so the, the real quest, quest would be, okay, now take for example, group field theory, tensorial group field theory. Let's take this as the emergence process, the one that I've shown uh, to extract effective cosmology. Okay, now let's look uh, at the metaphysical characterization of this process. Then, then I think we have a good uh, hope to, to find answers. Okay, let's hope. Thank you. Um, Pedro has another question. So Pedro, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, Daniel, it's uh, actually, this was my second question, which is quite related to, to basically some of the people have asked relate, related to relational clocks. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, it's well known, I mean, in, in, in GR that you have this uh, called grasshopper effect in the sense that uh, in order for, for basically degree of freedom to be a good clock, you must be sure that basically the dynamics uh, of that clock, I mean, is, is such that basically there is no turning points in that sense. Otherwise, I mean, you would ruin the, the, uh -huh. the whole business of... Uh... So I think that you kind of hinted, but through some approximations that you are making. Um, so how are you avoiding this? Uh, because, okay, I kind of uh, figured out that you are making this uh, uh, level of approximation and uh, 
but it's not clear to me how you basically circumvent this problem of making that basically, for example, it's dust or what, a scalar field, whatever it is that basically you take an internal mm -hmm. time. It's a good clock. I mean, you've in, in quote. In yeah. quote but, so, uh, because. So first, first of all, uh, uh, there, there, there is a practical thing you do. There are two practical things you do. And then I make a conceptual uh, remark. So the, the first thing, the practical thing you do is that you try to couple to your fundamental uh, degrees of freedom, some new degree of freedom that uh, in the best of possible worlds uh, will behave uh, like uh, a good clock. So we have chosen a free massless scalar field uh, and try to couple that at a discrete level because that system that type of uh, um, field, uh, in fact, behaves like a good clock in classical GR. If it was an interacting scalar field, or it was not minimally coupled to geometry or uh, bunch of other possibilities, then indeed it would not be a good clock, even if the whole continuum limit was uh, nice, if there were no additional difficulties. So the answer is you choose, uh, you try to, um, consider internal degrees of freedom in your fundamental theory that have the best chance of behaving like good clocks for what you know about them in the fundamental theory. Second, even, even in this case, even after we made this choice, I have tried to emphasize that uh, there are a number of approximations and indeed uh, it's only in some regime of parameters in some, in some level of approximation that uh, you have a good clock is the regime in which you can neglect, for example, quantum fluctuations of the same object. And that's true even in continuum GR. If you were just to consider a quantum clock, even if it was a quantum free massless scalar field, the very fact that it has superpositions will spoil uh, the perfect clock uh, situation. So even in the best of possible worlds, uh, the notion of a good clock uh, can only be an approximation. And this, and you have to just control those approximations in your theory. Uh, third, that's my remark. My remark is forget about it. The, the lesson is in classical and then in quantum GR that there's no such thing as a, a perfect clock. Uh, it can be at best an idealization. At best, uh, you know, can use uh, uh, something that locally in some particular approximation for uh, in a particular regime of, uh, of its own dynamics uh, behaves decently. Uh, you just have to live with that. And in fact, you can, you can always, there is the farther point, which is the, there's always more than one decent clock. In, uh, I can use uh, this or, or I can use uh, the one on the, on the, on the top of the mountain. Uh, I can use, uh, you know, something that is more quantum, something that is interacting more and, uh, and so on. And that's exactly the message of uh, general relativity brought forward at the quantum and then uh, pre-geometric uh, level. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Eric. I want to push back a little bit on the um, on the uh, on some of the recent on some of the recent discussion from uh, uh, that you had with Antonio and um, and, a, and a couple of other people, where uh, the notion of an, of ontology came up. Were you just were you just saying that you think it's important to get the ontology right because you're talking to philosophers and you think we like hearing ontology? Because I can tell you that's not not all of us not all of us think that ontology is the be all end all and that that that, that, that that's what we must have or we don't have understanding. I mean, I, I would actually argue that in almost every great revolution in physics, almost every great advance in physics, it happened in history. It happened precisely because people didn't care about ontology. You know, New 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 Newton developed universal gravity precisely when he didn't. When he decided not to tell us what uh, what gravity was. I mean, uh, you, Eric, you know that one of my favorite philosophers is Feyerabend. So I mean, just imagine if I, I could argue that uh, you need to get uh, the whole thing uh, right at that level before making any progress. No, no, no. I mean, so my answer, to, if, if your question was was this, and I can I can answer. Okay. So I answered to the question by Antonio, who was asking. Uh, uh, 
how we could uh, characterize uh, ontologically or metaphysically the emergence process. And I'm saying that uh, if I want to clarify the metaphysics of the whole story I presented beyond the physics, the first thing I will try to make clear rather than the emergence process is the ontology. And only that, uh, because that is uh, functional, I think it would be a preliminary aspect for the metaphysic question about the emergence, not for the physics or, or the mathematical description or uh, the other aspects of emergence and quantum gravity and so on. I am in, interested in the clarifying the ontology of my theories, but I believe that it will follow or it should follow or at best proceed in parallel with the development of the theory. I certainly don't believe uh, that I need to clarify the ontology, I'm not sure which basis, uh, before uh, uh, really developing uh, the theory. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm relieved to hear that, but I would still push back e even on oh, the- Come on, you know me. But that, that's a long conversation and I, and I don't wanna take it more time. Thank you.